Hey, it's Zach. If you like this podcast, please subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes and rate us. Five stars would make me so happy. Leave a nice review. On today's episode, the great Pablo Torre and I discuss the Houston Rockets and the Philadelphia 76ers, the two weirdest teams in the NBA. But before we get to today's episode, I want to remind you to check out the Woj Pod with Adrian Wojnarowski, like you need a reminder for that. This weekend in Chicago, it's All-Star and Woj will chat with Clippers guard Patrick Beverly. He's uh, generally a pretty colorful dude. The Hall of Famer Jackie McMullen and the Ringers Ryan Russillo, friend of the program. You can find the Woj Pod wherever you get your podcasts. And now... The Low Post. Welcome to the Low Post Podcast live from a cramped studio in New York City, New York, where I am thrilled, thrilled to be joined by the co-host of High Noon, the great Pablo Torre. How are you? It is so cramped in here. I am angling my body. I have one leg crossed over the other. My little water bottle is dangerously close to all sorts of equipment, but it is an honor, Zach. You know, my now wife once lived in an apartment where the bathroom was so small that I had to brush my teeth sideways. I had to turn my body sideways because my shoulders were too big to fit in the bathroom. I lived in an apartment in Chinatown when I moved out of my parents' house. And we had 300 mice. And we had a bathroom where on the toilet, I would lean forward and my head would be on the wall. Wow. So it was it was a great resting spot. And also, um, yeah, a life I'm glad I'm very far away from now. Um. I thought that you would be a fun guest to have on because I want to talk about the two weirdest teams in the NBA and two teams that you have been in, in you you cover all sports. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you do your job and get any sleep. Um Me neither. Yeah, I don't know I don't know anything that's going on. This, like the Super Bowl happened and I was like, I know two guys in the game. That's it. Um <laughs> I think I knew two guys. Um But you are these these two organizations, the two strangest teams in the NBA, hot button teams, you have traveled in both of their universes in various ways and that's yep. the rockets and the sixers and of course there's one figure that unites the two yes yes i mean i have had mountain dew with daryl Morey. yeah and mountain dew is disgusting it is it's like diet disgusting. mountain dew is his favorite drink i just remember being in his office diet which was, mountain dew is just like what are you doing have, right just have mountain dew just it's all poison just mainline for loco at that point Diet Mountain Dew. I didn't know he drank that Mountain Diet Mountain Dew. Yeah, I remember watching clips of James Harden, what now feels like one million years ago, when I used to like travel and report stories as opposed to gas bag on television, as aforementioned. And yeah, Daryl kicking his feet up on a table, drinking diet, chugging Diet Mountain Dew. I, I gotta ask, just him about reveling that. in James Harden. I gotta ask him about that on the Sloan Anal Sloan podcast we do, which is by the way the single best time to get Daryl Moore on a podcast is 4 p.m. the Saturday of the Sloan conference when he is so worn out. I don't think he has any idea what he's saying, and he's and he's liable to like say anything, and he knows it too. He's like, I don't know. I was, uh. yeah, he's already like waved off so many kids with resumes, and now he's just grateful to have like a face who actually doesn't want a job from him. Uh, yes, and he he's totally worn out. Anyway, um, the Rockets and the Sixers, of course, Hinky is the other is the commonality between yes, the two. Yes, uh, yes, a man you are close with. You are. I had forgotten about this until right now. You are responsible for trust the process. I say that. Uh, Dan Lebetard repeats that. Tony Roden would have objections to it because I quoted him. He was sort of the first uh, guy to sort of say it in a national media kind of setting. And, yeah, the story I wrote for ESPN, which was now, God, almost a decade ago, <laughs> eight, seven years ago. Uh, yeah, it kind of started from there with all due respect to the Rights to Ricky Sanchez podcast and all the Sixers fandoms that I ended up becoming way – too close with um it kind of started with that i want to start with the rockets though and i i'm very I, i'm very interested in your take because you are not in the nba bubble where i live where this is like they don't have a center everybody's talking about this my friend and former boss bill simmons like logged off of twitter in a I bit of that. anger the other night because this is so ridiculous like what do you think like do you like why have you seen the rockets without a center lately what do you think i love it I love it. And I think the first thing to be fair to Daryl and what they're doing, this was kind of born of necessity, right? Capella had the heel thing. Capella was not going to be playing. He was not going to be nearly as useful. And so it does feel like a necessity injury is the mother of invention kind of thing. But I love that Mike D'Antoni gets to be his Mike D'Antoniist. And the fact that you get an offense where P.J. Tucker is the center and Russell Westbrook 
has reached some state of self-actualization and James Harden may be okay with it. All of that to me makes this a fascinating team to watch every time I turn on my television. I am a noted by me, uh, <laughs> Westbrook. I, skeptic is a little strong. I, I, I just, I thought, I've always thought he's a little overrated. I didn't vote him MVP the year he won. Um, I think he's a great player. This is my favorite version of Russell Westbrook ever. This is the best version of Russell. This is just straight on, I am going to the f***ing rim and you cannot stop me. And you can play 10 feet off of me. I can still get by you. You can look like you have me, like there's a body between me and the rim. But I'm so explosive that help defenders are going to creep in because they're scared of my – and like someone's going to go, I love this Russell Westbrook. This is so much fun. I was watching him take Anthony Davis one-on-one. And Anthony Davis, rightfully, was terrified. Like, what do you do? And that is Anthony Davis. That is the guy, the former guard who became an elongated center with all the guard skills, seemed lost. And so Russell Westbrook, the fact that he is basically the big man, he's the big man. You know what he is? You know what he reminds me of when I watched him play with this new super small lineup? He reminds me of Giannis. Yes. Where, where they just, everyone plays off of him. People put centers on him like they do with Giannis and just invite him to come at them. And he's like, oh. Then I will come at you. And the thing that infuriated me about Russ in the way that I'm sure it infuriated you was that Russell Westbrook was under some delusion that he was good at shooting. Shooting threes in specific. And so the big... And not like the worst ever. Right. And not famously terrible. Not the guy who was raising questions about whether... Are his like legs injured? Like what is wrong with him? Why can't he shoot free throws? Why can't he shoot threes? And now finally, in this run of small ball... He's down to taking one or two a game. And to rewire Russell Westbrook, to re-incentivize Russell Westbrook, the most defiant human being maybe, to have played basketball, the fact that it took this experiment to do it, it he is uniting people who also had many doubts about him because, good Lord, I didn't think he could f-ing do this. The other thing is, and what I would say to Bill, and I, I, I said to Bill in text, it's like they're not – it's not that different from how they were already playing. They're just a little smaller. That's all. Like this is already how they were playing. So they went – this is the natural evolution of their team. So they went from Harden running pick and roll a million times a game to Harden discovering, well, I don't need to do that because I can just launch a step back three and like calling up a screener just makes – there's just more stuff going on. I just forget that. So Clint Capella, you go down in the dunker spot under the rim and I'll drive and throw you lobs. I'm like that's cool. And then wait a second. What if that guy wasn't even in the dunker spot? What if nobody was there? What if the paint was totally empty and I just like could get layups or kick out to people? For open? It's the natural evolution of their team. It doesn't look all that different uh, to me. And the numbers so far back it up. The NBA sent me these numbers today uh, with P.J. Tucker at center for the season. 115 points per 100 possessions, 100 allowed. So plus 15, which is massive. Yeah. I, I think this is actually specifically with Harden and Westbrook both on the floor. Uh, 75% defensive rebounding, which is like around league average, which is like if you can survive, that's that's a huge plot. I'm not sure they can in the long run, but that's fine. Super fast pace, tons of turnovers forced. Like this is – that's the math for them. Yeah, and what they do against big men, like defensively, is interesting, right? They junk it up. They double team. They throw hands at guys. Like P.J. Tucker, by the way, Daryl's been on this for a long time, right? Remember Chuck Hayes? Chuck Hayes had Love been Chuck Hayes. The, sh- the Chuck Wagon, yeah. the shortest center in NBA history, the shortest starting center in NBA history because Yao got hurt. In comes Chuck Hayes. But Chuck Hayes had like a 6'10 wingspan. P.J. Tucker has a 7-foot wingspan. And so I'm, I had an argument with Jalen Rose out here in our office. I'm gesturing out now to the bullpen area where – he was not a person who believed that wingspan was a decent substitute for height. I tend to be a guy who believes in that market inefficiency. And so even if P.J. Tucker is now beating Chuck Hayes' record as shortest starting center, because I believe with the socks off, P.J. got remeasured at like 6'5", if he's putting his arms up and there's seven feet of them, that tells me that maybe this isn't actually as big a deficiency as some may have seen just based on that like Wikipedia number about height. Do you remember – did you watch wrestling as a kid? I did not watch nearly as much as my friends and everybody in this business like loved it. And so please continue, but well, I am not an expert in Every anyway. once in a while there would be a big guy. Like King Kong Bundy was a big guy. Like yep. a big, maybe a little bit fat guy. 
and you would be like they would announce him as like 400 pounds and he would face like a little guy and the little guy would go to the other end of the ring and like rev up his engines and as fast as he can just run right into King Kong Bundy standing still and just bounce backwards I think that would happen to me if I did that to PJ Tucker <laughs> and he's not fat that's not what he's just like I don't I've never seen anybody move PJ Tucker. You can't prove to me that anyone has ever dislodged PJ Tucker. No, Steve Kerr said this last May, I think, when they played him in the playoffs. And I just heard uh Brad Stevens say this again when they beat the Celtics, who obviously small ballers themselves. He called the Rockets linebackers. There is a girth, a thickness to the Rockets that I think is missed when you just talk about height. Because PJ Tucker, man, on top of having like the finest shoe collection of any athlete going. He is a football player. Yeah, he does look like a football player. And by the way, I should say that Rikishi, shout out to him. He was the, that was, that was the sumo some, guy. Some of the things I remember Rikishi. I mean, and, and, you know. Just like straight up rubbing, like yeah, forcibly motorboating people with your butt cheeks <laughs> feels was, like a thing was, that should be recorded someone, in history. Someone must have said no. Some star must have been like, you know what? You're not doing that to me. I look at the animated GIFs on Twitter. I'm like, this feels like it should be banned. Like, this yeah. feels too NSFW for the platform we're on. But, yeah, shout out to Asian hero Rikishi. We have all had our fair share of sad breakfasts. Beige, plastic wrap, brick-shaped protein bars, day-old break room donuts, disgusting, frozen breakfast trays, no way. Not our finest moments. But now that McChicken breakfast sandwiches are on the McDonald's breakfast menu, we should never go back to those old Sad breakfast. The McDonald's McChicken is a breakfast worth getting up for. It's time to change your life for breakfast. Buttery, crispy McChicken biscuits and savory sweet chicken McGriddles, freshly prepared and now available nationwide everywhere at McDonald's. That's how you wake up breakfast at Participate McDonald's for a limited time. Sport Clips Haircuts makes it more convenient than ever to get a haircut. Introducing Amazon Alexa and Google Nest device online check-in. Enjoy features from Sport Clips website and mobile app check-in, but now with your voice. Save time by getting in line before heading to your favorite sport clips for your next haircut. Sport clips, you choose the cut, they cut the weight. So the Celtics game you mentioned, I believe, was two nights ago, The last their last game before the All-Star break, was interesting on two fronts. Number one, they threw Cantor into the game and tried to post him up, which is a nice test case of like, okay, here's a guy whose primary skill set is mowing people over. Now, he's not Joel Embiid, but that's what Ennis Cantor does. And he couldn't do anything. They doubled. They deflected outlet. They, they dared him to beat them by with passing, and he couldn't do it. And then Ennis Kanter was out of the game. Well, that's nice. That's a feather in their cap. They're going to have to do that a lot. Then at the end of the game, and it was too late, the Celtics went small themselves. They played Walker, Smart, Hayward, Brown, Tatum. So five guards, five mm. wings, whatever you want to call it. And that to me is the question for this. Is like This is all cool, and Houston has the talent to make it work, but – other teams, once they prepare for it and scout it, are going to, if they have the personnel, they're going to be like, oh, we can just do that too. We don't have to play a center either. And like, maybe we're actually better than them at doing it. And the Clippers, to me, stand out as an obvious team of like, you put Beverly, Williams, Kawhi, Morris, George, or throw Shamit in for somebody or whatever. And you're like, oh, they're going to outdo us. They're going to play. They're going to outdo us. And suddenly we'd like to have a little bit of a trump card against that that we don't have. Yeah, it does feel like there, there is a prophesied end for this team. And it's when they get outshot. Like when they don't get to be the team that is taking more threes than everybody and making more threes than everybody, like what happens to them? Well, th- I think that's part of what's happening here. And I talked about this a year ago um, when they started – shooting even more threes and the step back three became clearly like James had stepped up his number of that. Like Houston for like a two or three year period six years ago had such a math advantage over the rest of the league by just shooting more threes. And the rest of the league was like, oh wait, three is fifty percent more than two. Like that's that's a lot. Maybe we should maybe we should do that. And Houston's edge Houston like went from starting every game ahead eight nothing to starting every game ahead four nothing three nothing and it got closer and closer. And now they're like, well, we just got to go crazier. We got to be crazier now. And I do wonder if like what Houston is banking on in all of this is just the version of Russ they got being so much more than anyone bargained for. And it does feel like if Russell Westbrook is going to play the, I mean, you know this better than I would. Like objectively speaking, this feels like the best basketball of Russell Westbrook's life. 
I'm sure in Oklahoma City, there were years, obviously, his MVP season when the numbers would sort of suggest that, okay, maybe it was then. But in terms of being the most efficient Russ, this feels like right now, that is the answer. And if James Harden is okay with watching Russell Westbrook be the big man and just attacking the rim over and over again, and and James seems to be okay with that for now, then it just seems like a team that I had never contemplated really until like two weeks ago. Maybe James is more than okay with it because he's looked pretty tired over the last month. And his well, he score, was slumping, right? His I mean, scoring and his shooting had really dropped, and I wonder if he needed someone to come pick up the load a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't. Is it the best Russ has ever been? I mean, it's clearly the most efficient, right? But playing next to the year he won the MVP, he didn't have anyone nearly of his own caliber on his team, so he had to do all these other things. And playing next to Harden makes his life a little easier. But this is as efficient as he's ever been, and just I, it's my favorite Russell Westbrook to watch ever. It's not close. I like this Russell Westbrook better than triple double Russell Westbrook. Well, it's the version of Russ, and again, like part of the joy of Russell Westbrook for those who felt differently from you and somewhat from me. Um, They loved the fact that he made weird slash, that's a euphemism for terrible decisions. Yeah. Russ now, though, is just making all of the right decisions. I made some weird decisions in my 20s. (laughs) Weird. Um, uh, And not only – I. like he goes to the rim. You mentioned Anthony Davis. I don't know who it was against the other day, but he he went to the rim against the center. Gobert? It wasn't Gobert. I don't, maybe it was Gobert. Because there's Porzingis, Gobert, and Anthony Davis like in a row, and he it was rocked, just wild. He rocked the baby, which is what you're supposed to do when you have a smaller guy on you. When he scored over like a seven footer, I'm like, all right, you're just gonna rock the baby on everyone. Like, and I'm all for it. Go do it. Wild, wild. Um, yeah, I don't like. I so where does this team go? Like for you, what's what's the like we're, the West is so stacked, so I, it's weird. I do the exercise where I praise the Rockets and I love what they're doing stylistically. I love that Mike, Mike D'Antoni is like looking back at his own life and he's like, "Man, I should have done this earlier." Like I love, I love that. I love all of it. And then I look at the standings and I'm like, "Yeah, I don't know if they're better than the Clippers or the Lakers or the Nuggets. I mean, maybe they're better than the Jazz, but like that makes them what a top." Five team in the West and they're a top six team right now already. Like it seems like the ceiling might be lower, unfortunately, just because of how good the other teams are. Well, that's that's the skepticism, I think. And that's where some of the people that are are not thrilled with this look are are coming from is okay, so um you traded Capella, and then you traded a first for Covington, who's fine. You traded two firsts to flip Chris for Russ, and it's not clear that like, although this style is working, they had to play this style because Russ can't shoot. Like, Chris Paul would not have necessitated that's a total right. stylistic overhaul of your team. And so that's three draft picks gone. And have you moved your team up? Like, this is, this is cool and it's interesting and it's talking points, but the boring answer to your question is I still don't think they're as good as the L.A. teams. I still think they're just right with everybody else. Um, I think – and and again, they're they're an average defensive team. They've been a little bit better since going to this lineup. I am just skeptical that they'll defend and rebound well enough against really great teams who prepare for them, who run sets and slip screens and use flare screens and all the things that you're supposed to do when you know the other team's going to switch a lot. Mm-hmm. Because I don't know that they have the defensive chops to really to to win four games against those great teams. And at the same time, when you talk about all of the stuff they gave up for this. If I'm Daryl, and I am Daryl in 2020, and I am Daryl having the year that Daryl has had with the ownership that he has and the China stuff, man, I am doing the exact same thing. I am going 1 million percent in on the present tense because my future, (laughs) like, I love Daryl, man, but if you told me that this is how it all ends... It would not surprise me. People with the Rockets have insisted to me that his job is not at stake. Or his job is not as at stake as we think it is because of the China thing. I don't think it should be at stake. I just have a hard time believing that. From a purely, like, biggest picture, we're zooming out on the league and the business of the league. I just can't see that. I agree with you. And I think those people can say that. And if they lose 4-2 in the first round to Utah... I don't know what happens. Uh, That's it. That's enough. That's enough. I don't know what happens. Exactly. It's enough for this to be uh, plausible 
a plausible basketball decision as opposed to a plausible geopolitical, financial, ownership-driven thing. The other thing you've already seen teams do, because now that they're super small, they're going to switch everything. And the Celtics did that down the stretch. Jordan Clarkson did this down the stretch the other day. Teams are going to switch until they get their best offensive player against Harden and yeah. just say, go. And, and you know, James is going to have to – they're either going to have to not switch or James is going to have to buckle up and, like, actually do it on defense, which I think he is capable of when he tries. But maybe not against Kemba Walker. Roasted him a couple times. Jordan Clarkson, shifty guy you forget about. Like, once it's Kawhi, you're toast. But the thing you mentioned, that James has looked tired, that's worrisome. The whole point of getting all of these guys, when it was Chris, when it was Russ, the whole point was to keep him fresh for the postseason. And no evidence exists right now that the version of James Harden that we'll get come April, May, June will be the rested, optimal James Harden. Well, and that's the other thing is, like, is this sustainable? This is a big strain on some of these guys to guard up a position. Um, and maybe, maybe, maybe it's not, maybe it's, it's not that much of a strain, but it's something. And, and, you know, D'Antoni doesn't play a super deep rotation ever. No, so, no. Um, before we talk about the Sixers who ma- conveniently made their own big lineup change this week, uh, let's pivot to, I, I said to you that you needed to, um, just because it's All Star. Okay. So we have to talk about All Star. Yes. So question number one. They're doing the thing for the All Star Game now, where after three quarters, all of each of which has been its own independent game. I can't wait for you to try to explain this right now. Okay, so I'm going to. All right, no pressure. Maybe not in TV soundbite time, but I'll do my best. Each quarter is its own game. Erase the scores, but then after three quarters, the scores come back. Yep, cumulative score comes back. You add 24 to the leading team score because 24 is Kobe's number. R.I.P. So if the leading team has 120, you put 144 up on the scoreboard. First team to 144 wins. Now, this sounds complicated. Your hands, your, the degree to which you have been raising your hands like P.J. Tucker in the lane, getting all of your wingspan indicates that this is complex, but you've done a very good job. See, I don't think it's – I think it sounds complex, and when the game happens and they put that score up, everyone's going to say, oh, they're just playing to that? That's that's pretty simple. Like that's not hard to understand. I like it. I'm all for it. I think fans are going to like it. They use this ending. It's called the Elam ending in the the basketball tournament, which is the winner take all thing. It was a huge hit. I think it's going to be it's going to be well received. I like when the NBA gets weird. And I know for all of the shade I just threw at your ability to do what you just did very well. Um I don't think I don't think it's going to be the disaster that some have said it would I don't be. Th- I, th- I think it's going to be the opposite. I think people are going to like it. Yeah, and it's simply because, like, what were we getting from the old version? I've watched so many All-Star games. I've attended so many of them. And we know what happens. The idea that there might be a change in incentive around the end of games, that to me is worth investigating. And, look, a lot of leagues talk all the time about getting weirder. The NFL is constantly talking about, oh, what if we do rules changes? What if we do this? And the XFL is trying to innovate. And the AAF, RIP to them, they were trying to do the same thing. They don't get weird. The NFL's not getting weird. Major League Baseball, so many discussions right now about, well, what if we do a thing where you can draft opponents, which I love, by the love way. Love it. I think that should be a co- – I think the NBA should do that. That is where I was going. Why? Why aren't they? Like, to me, if you say that there should be a reward – for being the best regular season team. What is more of a reward than the ability to to pick the the team that you think is weakest? Like, it gives us everything. It gives us the reality TV of now there is... Imagine being a team that did not have the worst record, but gets picked by that one seed. You now have a geographic blood feud, and that is so much more than we were getting before. I think the longer the regular season the more reward you should get for being the best in it. Yes. Um, and so if that means like Daryl has pitched this publicly, he's pitched buys, he's pitched. I don't, I don't know if the NBA will ever get there, but I think whatever reward you can craft that is, I mean, I don't think it should be ridiculous. Like you start the first round up to nothing or something, but you know, you picking your opponents you know, like this year would have been a really fun test case. If the Warriors had stayed healthy, clay comes back, they yes. sneak in as like an eighth seed that nobody wants to see. And like, so you play your ass off all your like 66 and 16 year, the Lakers and all of a sudden like, I gotta play the Warriors. Like, that's not fair. That sucks. No. And it's more pure to do it in this 
hypothetical world. Because what you're going to do otherwise, with that recognition in mind, you're going to subtly maybe not try so hard to get the seed that you want. If it's at the margins, like that is a thing that we've seen before. And I'd rather I'd rather keep the purity of competition by introducing this impure selection show, which would be just great TV on top of a actual meritocracy as seeding and playoff stuff goes. Everything should be TV, by the way. And the NBA has started to like the lottery is now TV, including the behind the scenes of the lottery mm-hmm. now goes on TV. They're starting to make the player draft TV, they need Starting. to make it more TV. Yes. And this would be get the, get the owners in a room and pick the opponent and make it a TV event with like commercials. It would be great. It's a no-brainer to me. It's a no-brainer. But why was I talking about this? Because we're talking about all of the, the all-star changes that they're going to actually implement in the real world this year. Yeah. I'm, I think getting weird in all of these ways. Um, it's good for the entertainment of it. And by the way, it's good for the innovation of it. We'll learn some things about what the public can tolerate um, and what these players can tolerate. What are your other all-star ideas? Okay. so to, to, All-star doesn't need saving, but maybe it needs tweaking. If you're going to get weird, yeah, sure. and we should get super weird, I was inspired by what seems to be an actual article that went viral recently on Twitter about the rules that North Korean leader Kim Jong-il apparently implements – when basketball is played within North Korea. And so the rules he has are as follows. Slam dunks are worth three points. Okay. Field goals in the final three minutes of the game are worth eight points. This is, I already am suspicious. Three pointers real. are worth four if the ball doesn't touch the rim. So they're not three pointers. They are Three pointers, unless you swish it, at which point, yes, you get the rock and jock treatment. Lastly, a point is deducted for missed free throws. So, this radically. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. How many minutes is the eight point thing? Uh, final three. Final three. But if you're going to take a couple of things from this, because there's a lot I just threw at you and America and the basketball listening public, I want the slam dunk rule. Like that. I like the slam three dunk points, rule. Three points up from two. I do think that, as you have chronicled for years now, the three-pointer is arguably so dominant as to demand us to reconsider, like, what are we doing here? Yeah. So bring dunks back. That's good for You know what would be fun about that is all the little guys who get on fast breaks and don't try to dunk. Like, Kemba Walker would go all out, like, I got to get that dunk. Yes. And, like, probably someone would get hurt, though. Remember Steph slipped and fell trying to dunk in the Lakers at, at Lakers last yeah. year? Yeah. That was scary for a second. Yeah, yeah, that was. That was almost. But he, like, he had everything. He was putting everything into that jump because he wanted to dunk. That would happen yes, a lot. Yes, it would happen. I want more attacking of the basket. I want people to play like Russell Westbrook, incidentally, by virtue of this rule. And then the swish being worth four. On a three, I just love. I'm just worried we're going to have to review that. Oh, yeah. There's going to be like a VAR soccer style, like tennis overhand, overhead cam, uh, accelerometer, uh, second spectrum thing. But I, 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 I think that there is a purity to that, that we all fundamentally instinctively respect as basketball fans. Yeah. Like, and, and if you're going to go down the list, maybe you throw in something about like, you know, maybe you actually have to call bank. Call glass. Sure. For that to count. I was going to say. You can't just call gla- game Paul Pierce. I'm sorry. I, I not a, gonna, it shouldn't be a thing. The glass was neglected in these in these North Korean rules. Yeah, there Kim Jong-il to- has been overlooking some some finer points of basketball diplomacy here. But um, I think we just stumbled upon a good innovation for him. Eight points. That just smacks <laughs> of like I got drunk and made so Like eight. It's going to be eight. Yeah, I don't know. That, that one is the hardest for me to defend. Um, but the Supreme Leader, I assume, had a great reason for it. So, you know. I like All-Star. What's your favorite All-Star event of Saturday night? So I went to the Zach Levine Aaron Gordon dunk contest, which was – Which one? Which which was – well, Toronto? Toronto. Minus 20 degrees, groupies not nearly – having invested in the parkas required to wait outside. Um, <laughs> just That should have been a New York Times, like, photojournalism, like, gallery. Just, like, the humans who were waiting in minus 20-degree wind chill, not in the tunnels, but outside all of these clubs where the players and everybody else was partying. Um, we're partying. Uh, but, no, that dunk contest, man. Like, I just love the dunk contest. As much as I appreciate all of the other absurdity 
uh, it's that. If you give me a good dunk contest, there is nothing more memorable than that. It is the if, though. Like, the three-point shootout is always good. It's always fast. The dunk contest always has these, like, he just missed seven times, and I'm still watching him try to do this. The floor on the dunk contest is the lowest of all of them. Ceiling is highest, though. Ceiling is so high. When you had Aaron Gordon putting the ball underneath both of his legs and the mascot was involved for some tangential reason, like, and he, lo- and he loses... I mean, I'm still an Aaron Gordon truther from that dunk contest myself, even though Zach Levine did put the ball between his legs from the free throw line. I think Zach Levine is the best dunker since Vince Carter. I, I just I think he looks so freaking cool when he dunks. I like that he's not doing it. He's not doing it, right? I don't, I don't think, he's think doing so. It. I think he took a stand of like, if I'm not an all-star, I'm not, not going to do the dunk contest. Sorry. What are you excited for? I like the three-point shootout. Uh, who's in the dunk contest? I mean, Derek Jones. Dwight. I'm not excited for that. Right? I'm like aggressively unexcited for that Um, because it's going to be corny. Everything Dwight does is super corny. Yeah, Dwight is going to get – he has gotten already to the point where he's going to heat check himself, where he's like, I'm likable again. It's time for me to give people some old-fashioned Dwight, and it is going to be, yeah, as corny as you described. I'm not excited for the Rising Stars Challenge, which I have not watched one second of in about 10 years. No. Um, I mean, but here's the thing about the Rising Stars Challenge this year. That's where we'll see Ja Morant. I, 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 am, I, I am saddened that Ja is not in more things because if you give me a list and say, put the top five players you'd like to see most in an all-star setting, Ja might make this year's list for me. Well, if he had completed that dunk over Kevin Love where he leapfrogged Kevin Love, I think they just should have canceled the dunk contest and been like, he won. It's over. Like, yeah. That would have been – I don't know what would have happened if he had made that dunk. I think Twitter would have actually broken. Like people say that. I think that actually might have done it. And I want to go into the mind of Kevin Love in that moment because Kevin is thoughtful. And Kevin, to my recollection, kind of immediately went to social media and took it and owned it and was like, you got me. But there must have been some calculation of like, do I just delete all of my accounts? <laughs> Do I leave the internet? I think you might have to if that happens to you. Uh, it's actually not funny. Frederick Weiss is like a very not funny story since the Vince Carter dunk. That's right. Um, no, he went he went home to Europe and is living a life full of personal turmoil. And that's the best dunk ever. Oh, no that, question. That dunk is like you literally can't believe a human being did that. No, because we have seen this year, we've seen in college, I think in high school, we've been doing them on the show. There have been guys who've done that dunk, except it's not over a guy who's over seven feet tall in the Olympics. And knows how to play basketball. And is like plausibly actually a professional basketball player. Knicks. God, I don't want to talk about the Knicks. Wait, first off, were you around this office when Steve Stout was here? No. Oh my Lord. I came in. After he had left and I came into a buzzing office of just like Max Kellerman just went Frost Nixon on Steve Stout. (laughs) (laughs) My only thing I will say is this. Be careful clowning on the Knicks because it's going to turn at some point. Okay, all it takes is some luck in the lottery and then which they did decidedly did not have last year and then. They have a franchise player. I think that's what it's going to take. All this magical stuff is not working. So free agents, you're not counting on any of that to materialize. They already just like demoted the guy who came on here to talk about free agents. I'm not discounting it because it only takes one guy, and I think they had a shot before things went haywire last year. But the it's just like – but if they get lucky in the draft, all your clowning goes away. The second thing is it's like really not that hard to be a normal team. It's really, it really shouldn't be this hard. Like I, I like Richard Jefferson says s- s- some joke about not wanting to sign with the Knicks. In my inbox statement from New York Knicks chairman James Dolan, Steve Stout comes on here and says some stuff about like the coach is already fired. We're gonna have a new coach here. Blah blah. blah. Statement from the New York Knicks. Statement from Steve. Stout. Like it's just not that hard to have statement from the New York Knicks not appear in my email box like on a biweekly basis. Like it's not that hard. When I was watching Steve Stout. It reminded me of a cable news surrogate for a politician. It reminded me of a guy who was thrown out there on a losing mission and at the same time was not prepared for the amount of questioning that it turns out you legally, per the strictures of the NBA, can't answer and also, like, can't defend. Like, 
Good luck being the voice of Jim Dolan in public. Just like the job of being PR guy for the Knicks, there is not just be a like, number you could pay me. Well, actually, there is. I would do it for fifty million dollars. But short of that, probably like nah, nah. That's that seems like a a death sentence. Just don't do it. Like just like when's the last time you saw the the Grizzlies send out anyone to do anything but the mandatory like we just made a trade our GM has to talk interviews like it's a, it doesn't happen just don't do it. Anyone who travels frequently knows how tiring it can be. Whether you're on business or on vacation, a five-hour energy shot can help you stay alert and energized wherever you may be headed. Five-hour energy helps you get through your crazy on-the-go life. Zero sugar, four calories, and a convenient portable size. Five-hour energy is the perfect pick-me-up for busy, hardworking people. And now it comes in two great extra-strength tropical tastes, strawberry banana and tropical burst. Ooh. They are delicious and can take you to a tropical on-the-go experience. Try them both and then go online to shop the number 5hourenergy.com and use the code LOW, L-O-W-E, my last name, the name of this podcast, to receive a one-time offer of 10% off your order. That's not nothing. Go to shop5, the number, shop5hourenergy.com, use the code LOW, receive a one-time offer of 10% off. 5-Hour Energy, energy on the go. Okay, let's talk about the Sixers. Yes. God, I love the Sixers. I am obsessed with the Sixers. I love I them. Absolutely obsessed and with the Sixers. Sometimes hate them because I love them so much. But yes, I just can't stop thinking about this. In like in my life, the things I think about go daughter, wife, Sixers. Like it's, it's really, <laughs> it's really that order. Um, and so this week, the Sixers, to the delight of some of their hardcore fans, uh, decided that Al Horford was now their sixth man, and they are going to start someone in place of Al Horford. In game one of this experiment, it was Furkan Korkmaz who came in red hot uh, and has turned into a very good NBA, a good NBA player. And then in half number two, because Furkan Korkmaz stunk in half he had number zero one, points. it was Glenn Robinson III who isn't good and it will not be that person. Um, I am rooting for it to be Matisse Teibel. Yes. Um, uh, but it, And by the way, I bet at some point it will be Horford again. Um, but just some numbers for you. Their starting lineup um, for most of the season, the one they want to use, so Richardson, Simmons, Harris, Embiid, Horford, 105.6 points per 100 possession. That would rank 29th in the league. 29th, that's bad. Uh, 97.1 points allowed. That would rank first. That's good. Wow. Uh, isolate just Simmons, Embiid, and Horford altogether, 99 points per 100 possessions, which is just like you're, you stink. Um, but 97 allowed, which is like you're awesome. So the foundation of something interesting. I can't. I just can't give up on the Sixers because the foundation of such a good defense is there. They haven't been healthy together for the whole year, and I think this decision is really interesting on like nine thousand different levels. What do you think? I can't give up on the Sixers, and I specifically can't give up. And I know many people, many people that I respect, but I will not name check at this moment. Bobani Jones, Brian Rosillo, excuse me. Um, they want to break this team up. Why? Why break up Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, Zach Lowe, when last year they won 50 games and they were a bounce away from taking the NBA champions into overtime? Why give up on Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid as a plausible combination when the year before that they won 50 games, top three team in the East? The idea that these guys can't fit together is a farce to me because we've seen it and can they get better together? There's no question. But the whole Jimmy Butler experiment, which I mourn to this day because I hated when Jimmy didn't get the fifth year from Philly. And that seems to be at the root of so many of the on-court and psychological things afflicting Joel Embiid right now. Um, it just seems like we're denying a certain reality that this is not a thing we should abort right now. So I am furious with the national media in the way that the MSM talks about this. But I'm also legitimately hopeful that getting Al Horford the f*** out of the starting lineup wow, is going to really open up some things. As we saw in the one-game sample against the team that we all think in the Clippers can actually make an NBA Finals. Why did it take 50 games, Zach? Why did it take 50 games for this to happen? Well, because you paid Al Horford $110 million and you did that. Oh, right. Um, oh, right. You did that for him to start. And you. Um, I think I think the Sixers got a little too cute. Uh, however, 
it, it, it like Al Horford. Look, the the idea was Al Horford's going to start and he's going to be our backup center. Okay, now only one of those things is currently happening now. Um, and the Sixers will defend this by saying, well, he's still going to play 25, 26 minutes a game. That's what we're paying him for. That's fine. I get that. And and he closed the game alongside Embiid the other night. He did. So when you And I think they will play this game like when they have a lead late in games, they're just going to throw their giant defensive yeah, defense. lineups out there and, and try to close the game. Um but, like, what happens in the playoffs when Embiid is playing 38 minutes? Can you still get 25 minutes out of Horford? Because if you can't, your asset allocation has not been good. Um, I think this change, I don't think it will be a cure-all, but I think it is for sure worth giving a long chance to. Because you saw it already. Like, Embiid posts up. Simmons is the only guy near the paint. There's it like sometimes there's two guys in the opposite dunker spot. There's nowhere else for him to go. It just it looked a little cleaner to me. Um, and to your point about Ben and Joel, I disagree with you. I don't think it's a farce. Um, however, like I like Ben not shooting is a problem. There's just no way around. It's a problem. So here's here's my thing about Ben not shooting. It is a problem. I would like him to shoot. But we have come to the point, and Stan Van Gundy made this point on the broadcast, and I almost cried out of sympathetic neuron joy. He's been underrated. We've under we've gotten to the point where Ben Simmons is underrated. That's fine. I agree. I think Ben Simmons is awesome. It's still a problem that he doesn't shoot when your other best player is Shaq, basically. So so I agree that this gets fixed. So much easier if Ben gets a jump shot. And look, he teases us. We see the threes he makes pregame, eight in a row from the corner. And I think to myself, why aren't you doing this more? So I get all of that. To me, though, the way to address that problem in the present tense is to get some guards, to get some guys who can dribble and be the guy who allows Ben to be the role man sometimes. Burks is the one guy they got who could help them. And so Burks ran some offense. He ran some offense for the Warriors, ran some offense for the Jazz. He could be that guy. Against the Clippers, it was Josh Richardson, who, back from injury but also the dead, turned out to be a guy, 21 points, making threes, stretching the floor, all of that stuff. Like, just get some guards who can play alongside these guys so that the massive vulnerability that Ben has can be obscured and all of the stuff he does, which is wild, man. And you and I hope you agree on that. Like Oh, he's he, a fantastic player. Two way player wise, his defense, his speed, his ability to get to the rim, his vision, he leads the league in steals. All of it, man. So the defensive Ben that I will give right now, and my friend Ben Dietrich is sort of a radical priest of the Ben Simmons doesn't need to shoot church and i am maybe worshiping there for now sometimes but i also would like to see him shoot what ben can do we just need to stop acting like he is like like he's worse than he is i guess i just hate when people talk about him like he can't play basketball so it's still a problem because of the mb thing it would be undeniably less of a problem if magically instead of al horford they had two good guards who could dribble and shoot um, yeah. that made that they didn't have a ton of cap ability to do that. Um, we are all talking about one home win. That's correct. <laughs> the Sixers were already 24 and two at home. Yeah, they lost twice. That's so right. not a shocker. They won at home. Um, can I ask you about this though? So whether it's how this stuff plays out in the long term, and I've seen like, I consume everything on Twitter. Like someone has thrown a scrap a, a, a bunch of scraps of headlines into the air and I'm like looking at all of them and so I don't have this necessarily reported out. But I had read that home road splits aren't necessarily predictive of how that team plays in the future. Um, so that scrap of maybe misinformation is what I cling to because I don't know outside of the sort of psychology stuff we delve into why it is that they are so much the team I thought they would be at home and the opposite on the road. I don't know. Some of it has been like Embiid missed some of those games, um, and and like like Joel. It's all about Joel, and that's why his sort of disengaged play over the last two weeks has been really disconcerting. Because whatever it is, I I think Ben and Joel get along okay. 
I don't I don't think it's as bad as people have made it out to be. Their skill sets don't fit great, but I don't think you know I don't think that really like I think it bothers them maybe a little bit, but it's not like fatal. But if it's just not working and it's just not working and it's just not working, like inevitably just sort of by inertia, you get frustrated. You get frustrated with your surroundings and it maybe that was happening. I don't know. But they're pouty. They get pouty and Joel has been pouty and it is all about – like if they hit their ceiling, it's because Joel Embiid will be the best player in every playoff series that they play. I agree. He, I, I fully agree with that. He is the best defensive player in the NBA. He is an absolute monster force. He is capable of having efficient, brutal offensive games that they're going to need from him. And he's a good enough three-point shooter that he's going to have games where that works. It will be whatever they have to do to get that Joel Embiid, that's what they need to do. Yeah, I hate parroting Barkley and Shaq on this topic because they are like the Statler and Waldorf of I love Statler American and culture. Waldorf. Yeah, and, and me too. Unless Beloved uh, curmudgeons. <laughs> beloved curmudgeons who also get to be the voting block on who is tough and who is not. Who is mentally strong and who is mentally weak. Who is soft and who is not soft. Um and so I will admit, when I see Joel Embiid, again, one game sample, completely right. Bomani reminds me about this all the time. Um, when we saw against the Clippers, Joel Embiid play Montrez Harrell off the floor because he was just sealing and posting up underneath the rim and Ben would drop. He would airmail that pass in and no one could stop Joel Embiid. It does make me, it does make me parrot Barkley and Shaq and think to myself, why the f- Aren't you doing this every possible time? And I know it's hard, and I know it takes hard. it. It takes more than me just saying it, but it does have to do with that that motor and that desire and that idea that hey, sometimes man, like you are pouting way too much. And I I will admit to this: I don't think these guys are mentally weak. I don't think they're soft, but I do think that the idea of ego gets in the way, which is not surprising if you're 25 or 23 as it is for ben and joel but i would love it if they stopped at least giving the appearance of constantly subtweeting each other at press I conferences i don't think do they give that appearance i don't watch the sixers press conferences yeah all there was just like a scrum a... this week where it was like you know joel is complaining about spacing and but so joel, I... but joel has been saying that joel has been saying for a year i don't want to shoot threes if I have to, I will. Is that, that it's subtweeting? But it's also like Ben is not going to shoot. He's just not. It's, he's going to be in the dunker spot all the time. Like I, there's only so much territory on the floor. Like I just think that's an acknowledgement of reality. Sorry, he's not shooting. Yeah, Brett so, Brown said publicly, "I want him to shoot one a game. He won't even shoot one a month. Just shoot." So for you, where are we on Brett Brown? I think Brett's a good coach. I I think. Um, this is a big, big year for him as last year was, but I, I think he's like, you know, he's become a radioactive figure in, in Sixers land. I rarely, I, I think maybe this move took a little too long, but Al Horford is not like a dude you just bring off the bench lightly. That, that's a that's hard fair. move to make. That's fair. Um, so maybe that took too long and, you know, is it his fault that Ben won't shoot? I mean, I'm not sure what he's supposed to do. Is it Elton Brand's fault that Ben won't shoot? I mean, they've all been in his ear. They've all been talking to him. They can't physically, like, if, give him a hook on the bench and have him drag Ben to the corner or something. I don't know what he's supposed to do. And I rarely hear the Brett Brown critics. And a lot of criticism is fair. Like, they had an out-of-time outplay uh, the other night go really bad. And, like, that's happened a lot in the Brett Brown. Mm-hmm. Five-second violations, this and that. I rarely hear, like, what. so what is the structure that you wish to implement that is realistic? Yeah, I don't kill Brett Brown as much as other people do. I think Brett Brown is a good coach myself. I don't think he's the problem. If I were to rank the problems on this team, I would say it goes, number one, the front office. Because the front office, and go, again, and, and I now realize that I said on this podcast that I like things getting weird. This team is constructed way too weirdly. Well, I'll tell you where it all stems from. Where where does the lack of guards stem from? Where does is it is it because Elton Brand is now uh, John Elway? Where John Elway just drafts quarterbacks who remind him of John Elway? Is that and what so, John, is that what he does? That's what he does. He he drafts j- tall quarterbacks who are all terrible. 
Is Elton Brand just drafting a series no, they, of bizarro they, Elton Brands? Like what? Tell, where does this start? They just drafted Thibel, which looks like a home run. That's, I do love Thibel. He, he, this, when this office is sealed off, if he were standing outside, he would still find a way to reach in here and steal my phone. <laughs> Thibel and Simmons together. It's frightening. It's like watching two velociraptors I, hunt. I got, I was at a Nets game like a month ago where they were, like, and Embiid didn't play, and the two of them played together a lot, and they were, like, at full throttle. And I was on press road, like, like uh, sweating in sympathy with, like, poor Joe Harris, who just can't even see. Like, these two, these four arms are all around me. Um, patient zero of this is false. That's what happened. Yeah. That's, that's oh. why everything, everything that has happened since then is because of Markel Fultz and that they screwed up that pick and it could be Jason Tatum and it could be person X who actually fits their team. And instead it wasn't only not a person who didn't fit their team or a person who fit their team, but a total zero for them that they had to trade for nothing, uh, or for some draft equity, whatever. Um, that's everything from that to Jimmy Butler to where we are now fl- flows from that decision going haywire. I saw. And that's on the front office, the previous one, but still. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I, I did see a photo recently of Fultz and Simmons and Embiid and Robert Covington, and my heart fluttered. Like, as much as Fultz is the guy who is the outbreak monkey in all of this, uh, the patient zero, as you say, those four guys, if they were on the same team in 2020, oh, God, that team would be so fun. By the way, I still... Orlando is really high on Fultz. I still am like, I don't think you can look at what he's done this year and been like, and and say, okay, we have our point guard now for the next five years. I remain like, you put that dude in a playoff series. I'm not sure it's going to go well for you. There are tests that he has to pass because, look, and you, I'm sure, talk to people around the league in the way that I did about Fultz. People thought it was psychological. They did not believe that it was a scapular multi-syllabic physical ailment they thought it was his brain and i have done enough reporting around like sports psychiatry sports psychology where i kind of know look it's all one tank everything gets thrown in there it's not like you can separate oh it's performance anxiety and not this other stuff no it kind of is everything but if it's more physical in the end than it is mental um i still need to see him do it under the most pressure available well and i think i think that also applies to ben simmons and you're even a greater Simmons optimist than I am. I think Ben is an awesome player and really, really good. You you are even maybe 5% higher than that. He shrunk in the playoffs last year. It was undeniable. Now, they had Butler, so they didn't need him to handle the ball as much and all that. But for large chunks of that Toronto series, he was he, he was not very visible. Um, and they can no longer afford that happening. And so this playoffs is like this all the stuff in the regular season is is important, it matters, but that is what really matters. Yeah, and I, and look, I will confess to this too. I remember going Bomani and I went to go watch Sixers Celtics the year before that. So 2 years ago now. And yeah, Ben had that famous like pass to no one that turnover against the Celtics in I think game 6 and I was furious. It just felt like he was he was nervous and not ready for that moment. So, look, I am counting on his talent. I'm counting on the fact that, fundamentally, the reason he's not shooting is because he knows that that would be a worse version of him. I'm counting on the fact that Ben Simmons has actually the most self-awareness of anybody here. And it's just like, look, you want me shooting 60% from the floor. You don't want me trying to be a plausible three-point threat midstream and that he's going to do that and try it out next year. But I will admit that all of this is hypothetical. <laughs> well, and if this if this change can stick, and look, it it sounds funny that oh the spacing is so much better because Horford is a good three point shooter. They got him because he's a good three point shooter, and he wants he can stand out there and space the floor. But it's not it's still not quite his natural habitat. He sort of drifts, he scampers down into the paint. That's where he is wants to be at least some of the time. With this new ecosystem, you saw them the other night. They would put Ben in the post bring Joel down for like a weird screen in the post and like run a pick and roll from the post. And the Clippers had a lot of trouble with it. And like that's with better shooting, like that's a really hard play to guard. Stan was really hard on the Clippers on the broadcast saying, why aren't they going under? Why aren't they going under? And I get that. But you go under a screen that's set five feet from the baseline, like you're out of bounds. You can't in like so it op- it does theoretically 
open up more possibilities for Ben's ball handling to sing a little bit. I don't know that it's a cure-all. I still think, though, I, I think it's worth trying. And I just, I think the defensive ceiling of this team is still so high that I cannot and will not give up on them, no matter how bad they look, uh, to, to be a threat to win the East. Do you think that this team, I mean, we believe that this team was built to beat Milwaukee. And the problem is, <laughs> Milwaukee's even better than people thought. Yeah, they're going to win 70 games, and, apparently. And Toronto, Indiana, Boston, Miami are all better than people thought. So the yes. obstacles between you and that series for which you are built are now very, very serious things. Miami clearly loves playing the Sixers. It's not scared of them at all. Boston finally beat them, and I, I don't really buy into this idea that the Sixers are like their bugaboo. Um, and Toronto, Indiana's solid. We'll see how old Depot Depot progresses. Toronto's legit. Like, all those series are hard. By the way, Nick Nurse is going to win Coach of the Year, it seems like, and he's going to beat a coach who is going to win 70 games. Does that feel this way to you as it does to me? Wow, when you put it that way. I um, mean, Nick Nurse, with, look what he has. No, when you, it's the 70 games thing. No, Mike Budenholzer is going to go win 70 games, and he is not going to be coach of the year. So I'm going to admit something right now. The year the Warriors won 73 games, I voted Kerr coach of the year. Yeah. I did not want to, and I felt in my gut that it was the incorrect decision. And I don't remember who I wanted to vote for. And then there was part of me that was like, in 20 years, people are going to be like, wait, they won 73 games and some of these people didn't think he should be coach of the year? Because that was the year Walton coached the first whatever games of the season. Yep. And and I caved to the idea that, like, they just – it's history. It's just like, let's just remark on the history and reward. It's only coach of the year. Who really cares? 70 games is a lot of games, man. It's real. It's a pretty damn persuasive argument that you should win like all the awards. It, it is persuasive, but I also want to bring this up. And this is a vindication of you in retrospect, or at the very least, the version of you that didn't want to vote for Steve Kerr. This accomplishment means like relatively uh, dog now. Wow. What? What? Coach of the Year? No, 70 no, no, 73. Games. 70 games. The, like we just ran an experiment where the most impressive thing a basketball team could do is win 73 games. That is the most that, that anyone has ever won. And the regular season is theoretically the largest sample. They win 73. They lose in the finals, as we know, catastrophically, famously, all of that. And it's like, what's the point? What's the value of going as hard as they did or being as good as they were? The, more precisely in the regular season, if you're not going to bring home the ring, that means actually everything. Don't mean a thing without the ring. Seventy-two and ten. Um, a, a couple of things. Number one, the Bucks aren't even going hard. That's the thing. Someone asked me uh, on the jump a couple weeks ago, like, should the Bucks really chase seventy wins? I'm like, they're playing Giannis like twenty-five minutes in some of these. They're not chasing anything. They're just kicking the shit out of everyone and winning games. Um, number two, don't punch. Like multiple people or kick multiple people in the testicles because that will imperil your 73 win season. <laughs> number three, and I love Draymond. Number three, um, I'm writing about the Raptors tomorrow in my Friday column. They're leading the column. And, and part of it is about how they just have this like, they have a certain swagger to them and a certain confidence and, and intelligence that I think was augmented by winning the championship. I don't think you get exactly what they have without winning the championship. You can get close to it because some of those qualities are within them, but I don't think you get exactly what they have without the championship. Fred Van Vliet is going to make how much money? Like, talk about guys who get <laughs> the championship and become a new person. 15, 18, a lot, a lot of a lot. Van Vliet dollars. A lot of Van Vliet dollars. My, my point is Milwaukee having not won the title – is playing with some of that. Like Middleton is playing out of his mind. Bledsoe is playing out of his mind. Lopez hasn't even hit shots this year, and it doesn't matter. They look like a team that despite what has been viewed as a catastrophic four-game collapse in the conference finals, despite the supermax boogeyman hanging over their head, they look like a team that's really comfortable in their own skin, that's feeling themselves, but feeling themselves in a way that's not arrogant. It's not taking anything for granted. It's just like, we're even better than we thought. We're more connected than we thought because we've played together for a long time. This, like, they're they're playing with with a certain something. I mean, it's obvious they're forty six and eight, but I watch them play and I'm like, 
they're better than last year. Like this, they're they're more confident. They're more comfortable in their own skin. There's something in there that's interesting. So Chris Middleton had like a casual 50 point game the other day, and Giannis was out, and so that enables him to do that. But look, every conversation around the NBA can be real complex, and then it can, it can get real simple. And the question is like, do you have enough talent at the top end? And is Chris Middleton enough? This guy, yes. The guy, Middleton. This season's is, version of Chris Middleton. Middleton and Bledsoe, Bledsoe even more, play like this, and the Bucks are winning the East. The Bucks mm-hmm. are winning the championship. They play like this. Like Middleton's putting up, like you said, casual 50s, 50, 40, 90. Bledsoe shooting high 30s from three, playing with confidence, playing with aggression, playing with all the things that were sapped out of him when it mattered last year. They play like this, and they continue to get this kind of bench play. They are not going to lose. I think the skepticism is like, are those guys going to play like this? I think Middle, Middleton has a really good postseason history. Like sneakily, remember that seven-game series they lost against Boston two seasons mm-hmm. ago? He was like bananas good. Bledsoe's the one. We got to see it. We got to see Brooke make enough shots. Like there's some we got to see it to them, but they look really good. Do you think that what the Raptors did and the Sixers did when they played to Giannis – that teams, that there are enough big men that can, like, do you see Giannis being reduced in the postseason and then Bledsoe and Middleton taken over? Is that how this goes? Because you have to focus no. on Giannis, right? That's the whole strategy for everybody going into the series. They will not take over. Uh, most superstars do get reduced a little bit. Like, that happens not infrequently. Kawhi is gone. Um, so that's one guy gone that could give him a little trouble. That did give him a little trouble. Yeah. His jumper obviously has improved. The Embiid thing, we'll see, right? Like they they trounced them the last time they played um, after getting trounced by them on Christmas. And the Horford thing, as you as you indicated, was a lot about Giannis. Yes. Let's get another guy who guards Giannis. I think Giannis figured that one out. I don't think Giannis is worrying about Al Horford anymore after that Boston series last year. And he, I, I don't I don't think that one's keeping him up at night. Simmons, I don't think he's worried about Simmons. I think Embiid worries him. That worries is strong, um, but their path to the championship is that Giannis is the best player in the world for a long for the entire playoffs. That's that's what it is. Yeah. Um. This was fun. Yes, man. It's good to get some Sixer stuff off my chest. Thank you. It's talk to H- you ever talk to Hinky anymore? Um, the last time I talked to Sam, he and and Sam, if you're out there, um, He's I'm out going there. to contact you very soon. Because the last time you contacted me, you suggested that I read <laughs> – you suggested that I read the Robert Caro oeuvre on audiobook. I've, I've had that suggested to me. Too. And so I have failed, but I am resolving to actually go ahead and get to your level on my knowledge of the Robert Caro um, – Oeuvre? Masterworks, the oeuvre. Oeuvre? Oeuvre. I don't, like, um, I don't like that word. Yeah, it sounds too close to like ovary, maybe. Um, but nonetheless, there is a uh, a rebirth for me in terms of, yeah, what I owe Sam Hankey, and I owe him literacy, and I have failed to do that. But no, nah, man, it's been too long. It's weird. I feel like some people would imagine that I kind of am more in contact with him than I am, but we are overdue. I want him to remain a mysterious figure. I love that he is that, that he'll show up in a coffee shop in the Bay Area with like a buzz cut and people are like, is that? Is that him? Is the that whisper, him? Whisper, whisper. Uh, all right, Pablo Torre, you actually have work to do. Um, thank you for coming on the podcast. We'll have to do this more often. It's always good to get out of my NBA bubble. Your show is fantastic. It's high noon. Everyone knows it. You and Bomani, no one has to advertise that. It's one of my – It's one of my. Um, if I if I get my ass to the gym – that's right. I, it's it's one of my it's one of my go tos. Mm-hmm. I want to time it for that because it's it's it's. I don't have to work out very long. It's a half hour program. You know, I just can watch it and be done. I appreciate that, man. You are one of my go tos when I am getting my steps in because I exercise like an old person, so and so I. I get my steps in and I walk home. And yeah, this is a this is a this is a genuine treat for me. I'm a fan of all the that you do. Well, we'll do we'll do it again, Pablo Torre. Everyone, thank you. Thank you. The Low Post is presented by Goodyear. Drive always discovers possibilities. Goodyear, more driven.